mu times uh, x mu and y mu. X mu are the uh, examples. Y mu are plus minus one. It's an n-dimensional vector. This is plus minus one. Y mu plus minus one. X mu are vectors and dimensions. They can be real. They can be binary. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but I'm going to define their statistics because we want to do some calculation. Uh, so we are going to assume that x mu or h i mu, all the components, so mu goes from 1 to t, right? So this is the number of points that we have, number of inputs that we have, and we are given their label, okay? So I'm going to assume that x mu and mu are i and d with some distribution. I'm going to assume that the mean of x i mu is some x bar, something, okay. and uh, and that the, the variance is I just normalized to one, so everything will be everything will have one. Okay, i i d is the mu. i i d, all these empty components are randomly sampled with some distribution that the mean is x. spatial correlations and so on, but maybe we'll have time to open a specific discussion, but that is not today. So this will be the simplest case. Okay, so that means, okay, which of course would be in general position uh, in large N if you, if you get you know, any reasonable distribution, so that's not a problem. Okay, um, now why mu? I'm going to assume that it is with probability x plus one and probability one minus f minus one. In other words, I'm not, I'm going to allow for ask for bias coin generated the label. So it's again the IID random but with this probability. F and one minus one. That has important computational and also biological relevance where we want to think about maybe this is an output of a neuron that spike or doesn't spike or active or not active, that in many cases Neurons uh, are uh, in the relevant area uh, regions can ma can get up sparks. So, so the smaller the x is, the larger, or the higher the sparsity is. Okay. So in other words, if I put the input uh, and I ask what is the fraction of inputs that the neuron requires, it will be f. So if f is very small, then the spatial integrity is one. So that's a good uh, a good thing to allow. So that's, I think, what we are talking about. Now, as we already are familiar, we, we consider the case where n and t go to infinity, and alpha, which is n, uh, t over n, is finite. <coughs> so what we want to compute? We want to compute, uh, first of all, the capacity. The capacity will be um, alpha t is the maximum maximum log, the maximum alpha such that uh, there is W, there exists W uh, with uh, exacerbate uh, W transpose X mu minus D and uh, there exists W and D such that uh, times Y mu bigger than zero for N mu. That that will be, in other words, that, the, that this label input, that this classification task, okay, can be realized by a perceptron, by a high performance, okay? And uh, so this will be, alpha t will be the, 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 the largest alpha such that uh, with probability one in the larger limit, uh, there is a good Carlomo region. Probability, I mean by upper generation. This, this, this is why I'm talking about probability. So, so I'm going now beyond cover. Cover just, we turn from probability, from cover into probabilities by, by thinking about random. 
end of labeling, but the access of that journal to this material and make it more restrictive in order to actually make a statement about alpha sin, not to say that you know the long run everything is fine at the alpha equals two, half of them I want to have the entire means that um, I, I have a curve kappa of alpha or if you want alpha of kappa you know which is the same thing right in other words below capacity there are many solutions there is a volume of solutions okay but one of them will be the best and that one well at least in, within our definition that the support factor of the max margin we define the best as the one which gives us the maximum kappa that, that can be realized for this alpha. So then we will have this curve, kappa of alpha or alpha of kappa. You know, either the maximum kappa for this alpha or given kappa, you know, what is the alpha that the maximum important uh, quantity that we, that we want, so this is this number two, and we can go, we can ask more questions, for instance, we can ask, um, what is the distribution of fear? shape of the distribution. Okay. For instance, we can ask if we are looking at, at, the, at the solution with the best kappa, 
Okay, so we know that the fields will be always bigger than kappa, but how, I mean, how many will be, will there be fields that are exactly kappa? And that's important in the context of uh, support vector machine to discuss the, the fact that the maximum margin solution will, will have will have points on the margin because otherwise we can get a better margin by moving the, the hyperplane. So we expect in the max margin solution to have some, some of the points would be exactly on the margin. Okay, and some of the points would be inferior. So if we can compute the solution of fields, we should see then that there is a, a delta function at kappa and then some other distribution, so, and, and, and that's what, what really happens. If you look at the max margin solution, and this is kappa, then typically you have a delta function of kappa, and then some distribution. So this is now h, and this is p of h, for the max margin solution. All of them are necessarily bigger than kappa, but it turns out that you kind of push it to the limit, so some of them stuck to st are stuck with kappa, these are the support vectors. These are the, the vectors that lie on the margin. So if you have a, in the geomet in the geometric picture, and, and let's not have D here just for simplicity, if I have this is the if this is the best solution and the, the solution Some of the input will be the positive one will be on the on the on this type bo bo border here, and some of the minus one will be on the border here, and then the rest will be inferior. So the inferior one of this uniform or this not uniform continuous distribution, the one that are on the margin from both sides will be. So I'm now talking about the best one. The yeah. best one means the one which maximizes kappa. So, so for, for any scattered point, the, the margin is different, right? No, the, the, the maximum no, 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 no. margin which is possible is different no. for any scattered point. Or you mean for any realization of points? For any realization. Yes, but this is why now, now the statistics. The, pop, the, pop, 
problem is completely symmetric, right? So we will assume that this is zero on both sides, you know, but the other part is completely symmetric. And this is finite in one way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Train W internal W that's weird, I don't. But in, in general, what we're interested in learning is some generalization. So imagine this is some rule which generates lots of examples. Now I want not only to, to, to fit the training point, but I want to have a W that, that will also give some good generalization of examples like old Bachman that we spoke about uh, yesterday and so on. But it can be shown that <coughs> the smaller the number of supposed vectors, the better generalization property uh, you can have. So, so th these are important properties to, to consider. All right, uh, one more point is uh, the normalization of kappa. So I'm going to use this normalization and I'm going to assume just for simplicity that W is constraint on W uh, and, and read 
formally the problem that it is constrained can ask how, how it affected the system. And that's again biologically important. For instance, you can say that some of those neurons are inhibitory and some of them are excitatory. And then any training, doesn't matter what the data is, cannot change the time. Okay, so excitatory synapse will always be excitatory synapse. Or maybe dying, but it won't, it won't change the gender. Uh, so in, you can then modify the problem by any constraint on the on that. For instance, you can say the sign of those constraints. Okay, and, and then ask how it affects the intensity, the margin, the distribution of some of that. So there are many things here which you can add to make the problem more realistic and more interesting, both to Okay, so these are the questions. So now let's let's discuss uh, how do we answer them in statistical mechanics. <coughs> uh, I will have to probably skip some of the details because we are already. Volume shrinks to zero. Do 
beyond that, no solution is possible. Capacity to define capacity or capacity for zero kappa or capacity for finite kappa will be defined at the point where there is only one solution, our, our best mathematical solution. For kappa not zero. For kappa zero, that when there is a solution, there is no solution. And this always will be when the volume changes to zero. Okay, that's the, that's the frame. Okay. So let's then define the volume V, the volume of allowed. Then we have constraints. Okay, so we have uh, p constraints, so product of a mu goes from one to p of a theta function inequality constraints, which are given by, by this equation. So um, y mu w transpose x mu minus v. Then, as I said, when the volume will go to zero, that's when you know that that's when we are reaching the, the capacity limit or the maximum function. Okay. Now the problem is with this is that you know in dark space, this v in general will be exponential in n, and the effect of the constraints will again be exponential in p, and so on. And we know already that this uh, when you have quenched random problem, if you think about this similar to partition function, that is exponential in n, you have to be careful what you ask. Averaging v is relatively simple, but it's not relevant in terms of what we can do. It's wrong. It doesn't give the exact right result. Why not normalize with the entire No, that's not the issue. I, I can normalize with this. This is basically one or some number. This, this number is not exponential in that. And when you average something like that, you are going to be uh, picking up a highly unlikely set of x's and y's, which gives you good volume, but the effect is that I hate it. Okay. Anyway, this is a similar problem to all our random cases. I'm just repeating what we know from, from day one. A mild approximation, which means a mild averaging something like e to the minus n, and then something 
then you want to make this as small as possible by picking a particular realization which itself is exponentially small in terms of its, uh, uh, its probability. So it's not the absolute sign, it's what you can gain by picking up a real event which is unlikely and not interest. Okay? But it's not the sign, it is the it, it is how much you can you can gain by making this if, if, if this is minus by making this small, even though you are doing it by picking up an unlikely exponentially small probability event. Okay. You can normalize the limit, that's the number one, right? that's fine. You can define define this by normalizing this, but that's not the issue. Okay. <coughs> so we're going to unfortunately to do something about it. And to do something about it, one of the tools that we have is is the replica tools. And then that's precisely what the Average Vn. Again, to take the log of the wave, asserting log V, and the way you do log V is the same as the partition function problem. We are just multiplying it to the power, we're taking the power n, and that's our addition. And then take the limit, you know, D minus 1 over n, and just the zero, same, the same story here. So that means here, well, what happens here, that we have to take this and, and take the power of n. So the power n means that we have now dd alpha, we have alpha, and I don't like, you know, I mean, product of the alpha for this integral. Uh, this one will have a normalization for each one of its vectors, and we'll have here uh, uh, also constraints for each one of these vectors. So there is one w alpha here and d alpha here. Y mu and x mu are, of course, the quench variables which are not multiplied by the vector from x. It's only the degree to freedom that we are doing the, the, the statistical mechanics. So this is this w and d. And now we can basically average this as in the replica tool. And now we can see, we, without uh, you know, walking through R, just using color, is that the average of this because of this independence that I assume that each one of the vectors is independently sampled, I can just average it. <coughs> and, and average this over x mu and y mu for a single mu. So that's already a, a fantastic, that, that's the key to success there. Right? Now, of course, I have to do it from So what do we do with it? So let, let's work. Let's work on this on one of these terms. Uh, so question. So we had uh, H, you know, e to the minus beta times j i j s i s j as a partition function, a trace of s, and we wanted to average over j. Then what we did is we paid the price that we had. We had a thermodynamic degree of freedom, and then average over j. But j is not replicated. Same system, the same quench variable, 
we replicated the thermodynamic variable. The thermodynamic variables are this B and W, yeah, which we are reintegrating over here. Okay. So this is like a statistical mechanics, if you want, of, uh, of, of in the space of W, <coughs> and instead of an energy function, we have a set of constraints. So the constraints are determined by quant variables, X and Y, which are not replicated. Alpha, then a theta. What happened to the theta? Gandhi is higher. Gandhi is higher today because otherwise we would. Huh? Everything that happened in the theta, I thought it was a change notation. Change notation? Wow. This is a dramatic change notation. Oh, capital. So I have little m inequality constraints for each one of the real patterns. And then I have y mu w function alpha x mu minus b alpha minus kappa. So an n inequality constraint. And this is x plus b. Okay? And how do we, we deal with this inequality constraint? I don't know if I, I may have talked about this already. Remember, we, we represent it as an integral. So we, 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 we put delta function on this. We call this h. And we put the delta function on this. And then the theta <coughs> would be another integral of the term. So if you want to see what will happen. So for each one of them, I introduce um, D H alpha mu. This this would be this guy the, the inside. This this is this. So now the theta constraint is just simply that each one of them goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So I have uh, alpha in and little n integral of this sort for each one of the patterns. And then I have to put the delta function that h is this, right? So then I have another set of integrals from minus infinity to plus infinity, d h hat um, alpha mu on the two sides. And then I have in the exponent, I'll have uh, <coughs> what's the exponent called? Minus. So I'll have minus i sum over alpha h hat alpha mu h alpha mu. Plus i <coughs> sum over alpha h hat alpha mu times what times y mu w alpha function x mu minus b x. Okay, so that's that's all designed to give me the thing which I want to integrate to other I'm now going to use the fact that the, the, this summation here, this wx is summation of the i. And each one of the i are again independent other variables. So I want to factorize the average over x to a product of the i. Okay? So I can write down this e to the sum over alpha i h alpha mu y mu. Then there is also, I can write outside, so 
some of that I, it takes all this and gives me W I alpha X I. This is the plus one of two. <coughs> so I rewrote this part here, this exponential of this part, as e to the sum of the I. And now I can, so what I want to do is average over X of this one, and then this I can write down as pi average over x of each component, e to the um, sum over alpha i dash x um, alpha mu, y mu, w i alpha, all this times the single x i, x i mu. And now I want to average now. I can assume x to be Gaussian with mean x bar and the variance one, even though uh, in general it may not be the case because in the large n limit, the central limit theorem will work and only the first moments, first and second moments are going to be important. So, the, the so the including what? Pretend, but leave it as an exercise that x i mu is Gaussian. Then what this will be, this average over this x i mu, will be pi i e to the sum over alpha i h f mu alpha y mu w i alpha times. And then the fluctuations will be just be the square of this. So then we have minus one half sum over alpha and beta h hat alpha mu h hat beta mu. And then there will be sum over i alpha sum over i. I'm sorry, not yet half. So this will be then w. So now we can take the product of the i and simply, um, and simply sum the exponents. So what we get is e to the x bar times sum of the alpha i hat alpha mu times, um, instead, of, instead of summing of the alpha, I write it as w bar. W bar, W alpha bar is just the mean sum over i of W i alpha, which is all the parameters of W bar, simply summing over i of this quantity. And Q alpha beta is again summing over i of the product W i alpha, W i beta. So in usually in some 
sometimes write this as one of the envy and so on, but, but here I normalize W, the, the next of W to be one, so W times one of the square root of N. So this is the right right order. The invariant one? The what? The invariant one? The variance of X I know is always you can normalize W. That's one possible. But I also assume that the norm of W is zero. Yeah, the variance. So we just integrate the Gaussian 
Gaussian variables, very easy. So by integrating them, we bring this integral, what we end up is having e to the minus one half log of the determinant, minus one half log of the determinant of the matrix Q, matrix here. Then, and then the quadratic thing here, which will be plus one half sum of the alpha beta H alpha. So now you see, instead of having W alpha bar, I can shift it, call it N. Because I have D alpha and W bar alpha, so I can call it N um, plus or minus, doesn't matter. N alpha one U, and then have the inverse of the matrix Q alpha beta times H alpha, H beta minus. And beta is the total offset with D and then W bar and H bar. Okay. So that's what I have. So we got rid of H hat, which is good. <coughs> Usually the hats are the things that you want to get rid as fast as possible because they're just auxiliary variables. And then you have this now, the effective Hamiltonian of the actual H's of the local field. Representing the actual field, which are this field. Um, okay. So, uh, so now we see what the theory tells us about the effect of the constraint on the field, on uh, uh, on the output from the from from each one of the constraints. So it's this log determinant Q. But look at this. It's basically Gaussian statistics. Gaussian field. Okay? So we have this uh, H. So now what we have is a, you know, D pi alpha, D H alpha kappa to infinity U. Okay? But now it comes with a Gaussian measure. Gaussian measure, but there is still a local constraint that things have to be from kappa to infinity, from zero to infinity. So this is not going to be a simple integral. It's like in the ideal model in the spin lab, instead of having H, we'll have binary. You know, we'll have some effective Hamiltonian on the spin, local spins, and uh, and they will have to be plus minus one. <coughs> Here, the fields are not plus minus one, but the fields are constraint to be positive or to be that happy. So that's kind of a non-trivial problem. Take a Gaussian measure and integrate only the slice of it, which obeys the, you know, the quadrat, which obeys the, the, the local uniform set. Hmm. Okay, good. So let's stop here.
I can write down this contribution, which I multiply by u, the whole thing, then I can write it as e to the uh, to uh, e to the p, right, because there are p of them, or n alpha of them, but actually it's fraction f of them comes with a positive y, and one minus that is a negative y. So we can write everything as n e to the n alpha times f, no, so, so we write it e to the n, uh, let's write it e to the g one, and g one will have um, g one, g one will have um, n alpha f times g one plus plus n alpha one minus f uh, uh, yeah, times g one minus. So the pluses and minuses give them only the sign here. Summing in the exponent over the plus pattern, so it would be n alpha, and one would be would be plus, and the minus pattern would be minus. So that's 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 the structure of what we get in G. Okay. Okay. So, um, but but uh, what happened to this Q of the parameter and to this uh, n, which has this W? Of so as usual, we have to go and to and to constrain the definition of the Q and the N and so on. So what we'll have is in the in the full problem V to the N. If you go back to it, we had V V alpha I alpha V W I alpha. We had uh, delta. one, we had this power. Uh, then we had a constraint, but now we have to add a set of integrals over the other parameters. So what I'm going to do is I have dv alpha, I have now v um, uh, v uh, m alpha v m hat alpha I have v And for the constraint from the unit C of W, I'll add V lambda alpha. All these are global constraints. Constraining M to be the mean of W, constraining Q to be W, W, and so on and so forth. So what we get there is um, Then there will be in the exponent, I'll keep in the exponent, there will be a root of n times sum over alpha, n hat alpha b alpha, which comes from the definition of n. Then there will be, this is all this, then we'll have pi i goes from 1 to n, and alpha 1 to n, little n, v integral v w i alpha with Hamiltonian, which has all these constraints. So Hamiltonian would be exponential minus the root of n times some times x bar times sum over alpha n hat alpha w i alpha. And then there will be minus n over t times sum over alpha beta w i. So, 
of the lambda are along the way I, I want also to get rid of the constraint on W to be a linear sphere you know not to get rid of it but to present it with a the delta function with a, with a, with a with an integral so lambda alpha if you so look at lambda alpha okay. lambda alpha is lambda n, one, n over 2 lambda alpha here and there is minus n over 2 lambda alpha times w i square that constrains the norm of W to be 1. Q hat constrains Q to be W i alpha W i beta somewhere. And, and the n hat term constrains n to be this h bar times some of the alpha W i alpha. So all these are imp implementing the constraint by the definition of the other parameter And then, okay, and then this one, all these ones will come times what I call e to the g1, which is this integral of the field. So, so this, is, this is what I call e to the g1. Okay. So you see that the problem separates into products of two problems. One is integrating what the w as the original variables that we that we uh, wanted to give uh, that we introduced for W I alpha. But the, the measure of them is simply the other parameters. There is no inequality constraint with them. As I said, it would be a bad way to deal with it. So this is just entropic terms affecting W I, I alpha from the normalization and from the definition of all the parameters. So that's easy because W is not constrained this way. So minus infinity to plus infinity is Gaussian integral. You can just do the integral with W. So that's that's one term times the constraint, which now the inequality constraint, which now appears here in the, in the problem. So usually the way we we write it is we write g to the n as e to the g zero plus g1, where e to the g0 is all this thing here. And like the, 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 the imposed entropic measure on w coming from the order parameters and the normalization constraints. And then e to the g1 is the inequality constraint on the field h, the yeah. integral of the field. That's typically the problems uh, type of uh, formulation uh, happens. And we saw also examples of that also on, uh, in other problems, uh, the separation between kind of simple entropic uh, terms and, uh, and the following specific uh, uh, constraints or energy functions. Okay. All right, so as I said, these integrals are simple because they're linear W, because they're Gaussian W, you can do the integral. And uh, so let's do that. So, well, you know, you, can, you know what will happen. You'll have, um, I, I'm now integrating W, so basically I'll have the long determinant of this. The integral of the W, Then this is this is coming from this is coming from uh, from here. Uh, I'm sorry, there is no n here because the product of the i is also n here. Okay, um, and from here it will be where is this n? Where is this n? N. Uh, this will be one. This will be this. Okay, 
So where are we? So this e to the g0, which I'm looking at, I integrate over w, I get then all this quantity in alpha, it's q, q, and so on, and I get from the integral over w this, and then I have this for the e to the g1. Okay, so I can now I have to do something uh, to move forward to actually solve the problem, and the way we do it, we say that these are all all the parameters. So given that they're all all the parameters, we do seven points. And I assume we have to change the next step. So that's the next step. So the next step is to do seven points on the all the parameters. And what about the n factor in G1? The what? So there is n here, there is n here, and G1 will be p, right? N alpha. So basically we say, you know, lambda alpha is lambda, d alpha is d, uh, m hat <coughs> alpha is m hat, n alpha is m, and q alpha beta is the usual story, 1 minus q with that alpha beta plus q. Why 1 minus q? Because the diagonal is because of the normalization, in full normalization, the diagonal is one. So we have this structure, and then Q hat alpha beta will have Q hat zero minus Q hat one will be a term on the diagonal, and then there will be a term on the top diagonal, Q hat one. 
So there is always a solution like that. <coughs> now the question is whether <coughs> there is a parameter regime where we have to break the replica symmetry. The answer is no in this particular problem because it's a complex problem and there cannot be state transition. Uh, <coughs> we need non-convex kind of free energy uh, to, to, to have symmetry break and something which is different. So in that same class of problems like uh, like the computing eigenvectors and quantum matrix that is also inherently a linear problem. This is not a linear system, it's just inequality, uh, linear inequality for the <coughs> particular flavor, but again, this is important, they have the same, this is a correct uh, answer, so there's no replica symmetry breaking uh, in general. If you if we want to, if we are interested in the regime where there is no solution, it's above the capacity, where there is no perfect solution, we can still ask what is the solution that is minimizes the error. So we have this answer, and again, I, uh, uh, I, I won't go into the details of, uh, I mean, then, you know, we can, and 
So these are the only non-trivial, uh, no, there is no end here, just the, the matrix itself. These are the elements of the matrix. It's also replica symmetric, the delta to one minus q, that's why the constant from the structure. So this is the kind of thing that you have to use in, 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 uh, in this, and I won't go into the details. Um, I'll tell you one thing. Now you put this uh, ansatz into what we call G0, which was you know, all these other parameters and the integral of the W, everything I think, not the integral of the W, you put everything together and you get a simple, <coughs> a simple quantity, a simple expression for, for G0. So it turns out that G0 
cos q, I, I call q zero, I call this difference a delta q hat, q zero hat on the field. So that's all. Logs and derivatives of that. So that's good. Now you, what you do, you take, you take derivative respect to the other parameters, q hat and lambda and uh, all this on the hat, on hat and so on. So now it's a genius, because now we have to integrate over all the fields of n of them, the replica, and they are coupled by the off diagonal term here, which is which is this term, right? Minus q, which is this term here, q over one minus q squared, as we should actually see. But because of the replica symmetric structure, I can write this the, 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 the coupling term sum over alpha, everything squared. And I can decouple this, again, the, the square by adding Gaussian field. Why do you do it in vector model? Uh, 
the end result is, and I'm not going to go through this because it's going to be a long way, the end result is that I can now handle, this is a G0, now I can, with, with this vertical symmetric untap, I can easily write down, easily, after some work, I can write down what G1. So what does this give you? This gives you, uh, for any alpha and any f and kappa and so on, it gives you q, if you solve it, where q is the overlap between the w's. But you remember that as in the case of uh, Edward Anderson and Spindler that we started with, you can think about this q as kind of Edward Anderson order parameter where you average first French average, uh, sorry, Fermat average, then square, and then kind of do French average. This is the order parameter Q. It's the same as the one that we started at the beginning of the course. Same interpretation. But what does it mean here, the Fermat average? What, what's going on? What is this really mean? So you have to remember that in general, the low capacity, there is not one solution. There is a whole volume of solutions. Okay. So it means that I can take two solutions. I, I'm sorry, that I can take, I can, I can look at for given random weights, uh, random x's and y's, I can average w over this slice of space that is allowed. So this is this 
thermal average. This thermal average is averaging W, Wi, over all possible solutions for a given set of X and Y, for a given random realization of inequality, for instance, of X. And I so this is this this is the meaning of this average. Then you square it and then you average over it. Because if you average without squaring, you will get zero because you know everything is let, let's say B is zero and X prime is zero and so on, then basically everything will be average to zero. So let's have the same effort under some other parameter minimum. Thermal average and then French average. <coughs> now you can see what happens when you approach capacity. When you approach capacity, there is only one solution. But if there is only one solution, this thermal average doesn't mean it. Then I get back the norm of W, which is 1. So capacity is looking at the limit of Q goes to 1. Q goes to 1 means the volume shrinks to 0. That means that the typical volume shrinks to 0. And then basically we take this problem and find for what alpha Q goes to 1. That's good answer. The smaller the Q is, the larger the volume of the large solution part. Exactly. When alpha goes to zero, Q goes to zero. Okay, fine. So if you solve this problem and compute, you know, by taking the derivative scheme and compute Q as a function of alpha, so what you find is that this is alpha, so this is zero. Essentially, no constraint, so everything, is, everyone is happy. So this average is basically zero because the constraints are so small, the number of points are so small that you average over W plus minus and you get zero, and then you get a point where you get to one, and this is alpha Q or alpha of kappa. So it's called kappa maximum or alpha Q or kappa of alpha Q. That's the way to detect the capacity by looking at at, the, at, at, at what point we are the, sh the, the, sh the volume of solution shrink to zero. Okay. So again, I, 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 I'll put the notes, uh, or rather Jamie will put the notes after correcting some of the typos uh, into uh, on the website. Um, uh, I hope you, you will have uh, a chance to look at them. show you at least roughly what is the structure of the solution when I say Q goes to 1. How the solution looks like. How, how do, that, that is important. How do I take the limit Q goes to 1? Turns out that the limit Q goes to 1 is simpler than Q less than 1. Q less than 1, okay, uh, you have to reduce it to Q, you have some complicated function, you have to do it numerically. Q goes to 1, you can do everything analytically. Structure is not only gives you the capacity, but also the structure of the very deep meaning. The structure of the of the of the solution when Q goes to one has very deep meaning. If you understand this, it's easy to generalize to many more complicated problems, including the problem that uh, Ben Lee and Shizun and I have been working uh, on more recently. It requires deeper understanding of the structure of the theory when Q goes to one. That's I want to qualitatively. I mean, that's I want to uh, discuss uh, in full here. The, the nature of the double solution in Q goes to one. What?
yet it's the physical properties which don't depend on a particular language. For instance, as I said, Q. So this that this guy here for given I will depend on this particular actor. And we cannot get this from the field. We can get the distribution of it, but not the individual, not the value of W1. Okay? But we get Q and from Q we can infer what's going on. So it's all takes such a there is a price to pay by averaging at the first at the first uh, stage, uh, but there is enormous benefit that you can get properties of a system to the extent that they don't depend on a particular relation, like capacity, like distribution of things, like maximum margin, and so on. All right, so that's what we start from here. Okay, maybe.